Hello everyone and welcome to Conversations with Kate and before I introduce my amazing guest I want to tell you that what you just heard was my theme song. I have a theme song now and it's a, a beautiful piece that was written by a young uh, songwriter and musician named Ethan Sherman, very talented and I even suggested the title, it's called Shakertown. Now, I'd love to introduce you to my guest. This is Chris Woodyard. Say um, hello, Chris, to everyone at St. James and beyond. Hi, great to see you all. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. <laughs> I have been so looking forward to this. I'm, I'm honored to be have this conversation with Kate tonight. I'm the one who's honored. And you know, Tom Abbott's already in the chat and he says, my favorite newspaper man. <laughs> and that's Boom, so- newspaper that's, man. Newspaper man, that was the first thing I was gonna say that that I think of you as a newspaper man, and apparently that is that is what you think too. I think is of myself right? as a newspaper man. A shoe leather, you know, little bit rumpled, beat up old car, but a digger, I a you know, absolutely devoted to the truth, um, and loves deadlines and loves the smell of ink. <laughs> so that is that is a classic description of uh, the classic newspaper man, and and uh, and yet you are a newspaper man, uh, also in a digital age. So you don't get to smell as much ink, but but I think that you can still be rumpled. You can, <laughs> we're going to hear the whole story of of what it means to be a newspaper man, and um, and. On the way there, I just want to first find out, I always ask my guests <clears throat> if they are native Angelinos. And so can you tell us where you're from? I am indeed a native Angelino. I, well, a native Southern Californian. Um, I was born in Long Beach. My parents both met in the Midwest. They both worked at Sears. They were both in the ad business. And um, we lived in Long Beach for about 10 years. We moved to Palos Verdes, to Rancho Palos Verdes, on the San Pedro side. And then I uh, 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 went off to college in Long Beach and my career began. Wait, is, is Rancho um, Palos Verdes, is that a coastal town? It's, is it a beach town? Uh, Rancho Palos Verdes is one of the four cities on the Palos Verdes Peninsula. Um, mm -hmm. It's the one that faces San Pedro, although parts of it, it was the last one, so parts of it are sort of distributed around. So it's south of Los Angeles. It's close to, it's, it's, um, looks, overlooks the harbor and, and um, you know, it was an interesting place to grow up because it's very was beautiful it? there. Very beautiful, and it's I'm still, sure it is. Still a bicyclist paradise. I do a lot of bicycling, so it, you know, worked out great that way. That's wonderful. So, so when did you, back to this newspaper man idea, when did you find out that you wanted to devote your life to reporting? Um, amazingly, it was in high school. So in high school, I, uh, uh, you know, was like a sophomore or junior and I discovered you know, I knew I liked writing. So I, that, mm -hmm. you know, I had the writing thing going for me, yeah. but I never really understood how much influence and, and how much the ability to change things you could have working for the school newspaper. So, you know, there was all the usual stuff, but so anyway, I started working for the school newspaper. I was on it for two years. And by the end of that, I was hooked. It also helped uh -huh. that it was the Watergate era. So, you know, oh, yeah. at the time with Woodward and Bernstein, everyone wanted to be a reporter everyone loved the glamour yeah. and glitz or what they thought would be glamour and glitz of that um, right and, well um, yeah because they we thought they looked like dustin hoffman and robert redford 
<laughs> the exact, well, yeah, I, well, I only wish, but, um, you know, um, you know, I went off to Long Beach State, became a journalism major, um, and then got some lucky breaks when it came to getting an internship at the LA Times and working at KFWB, an all news radio station. But in high school, you, I love what you said about how you noticed that writing changed things. That there it's, was, it's that, amazing. That there was... It was like it's it's been the most amazing career, you know, all forty something years of it, in the sense that you can have such a, a wonderful chance to influence the world and bring about change in a very positive way. You know, highlight things that are wrong, highlight things that are right, talk to interesting mm. people, talk to CEOs, mm. talk to homeless people, uh, mm. sometimes in the same day, uh, mm -hmm. never knowing sometimes what the, what the story will be when you go in or what will happen. Um, it, so it, that, so know, the, I love that idea too. So very you... early on. I like that idea. You go in, you don't know what the story will be um, until you really get into the conversation. And then I'll bet there's a moment. Well, a well of there click. Is, you know, there, there, there can be a moment that clicks. So now, do you mean from a standpoint of click knowing this is what I want to be or click this is what the story is going to be? Oh, I'm talking about the story. I mean, we already found out that you, you clicked in high school. You realized, or unless you can right, actually right, right. zero in on an exact moment when you knew in high school, like, or was it just that you just started writing stories and you just realized? I just started stories and just sort of realized. But, you mm -hmm. know, it was so refreshing to get to college and mm -hmm. uh, know what you wanted to be. You knew exactly what you wanted to do. And you fell in yes. with that click, and there was a group of us that are still friends, you know, that oh, all really? went on to amazing, amazing news mm -hmm. careers. I mean, one won a mm -hmm. Pulitzer, uh, one became a top editor at the LA Times, one right now runs one of the top news services in the state, a startup that he put together, you know, one would say almost single handedly. And all of them have had like a major influence and all had really great careers. And we're all still friends. And but you, you know, all it's hit amazing. The ground how running. Yeah. We all, we all hit the ground running. But, you know, mm -hmm. talking about, you know, when you never know what it's going to be. I remember one day I came into work um, in about 1999 and had a regular average day. And mm -hmm. at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, they said, how fast can you get to Hawaii? I said, immediately. They said, well, there's been That's a, a great Xerox question. repairman. <laughs> there's a yeah. Xerox repairman that went on a murder spree. And um, it killed like four or five people. So I just literally left the office with the clothes I had, went to LAX, bought a ticket on the first flight out, a Delta flight to Hawaii. So, you know, here I was in work clothes, surrounded by all these people in luau shirts. I know. <laughs> got to Hawaii, got like one interview with the cops as fast as I could and ran to a payphone. Yes. Because it was Hawaii, I ended up turning it into like a four-day assignment. I was at the at this wonderful hotel overlooking this marina in Waikiki. And every day I was like interviewing people about what happened and the killer and that sort of thing. And it was just one of these wonderful things that happens in the news business on a lark sometimes when something breaks in a really interesting, beautiful place and you get to pursue it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, um, and did, they, did they find this person and solve the crime? I mean, it was, you know, as as these kinds of things go, it's pretty routine now. But at the time, it was kind of a big deal. And, um, you know, guy had an interesting background. And it was it was fun having a rental car and driving around parts of Hawaii that I hadn't seen before on Oahu and interviewing mm, people yeah. that knew him and friends and that sort of thing. But, you know, yeah, it's, absolutely. it's just such a great example of the kind of things that when breaking news breaks, you've got to go. You can't hang around. And... And I think you were in a, on assignment in Afghanistan at some point. Was that was that right after 9/11? After 9/11, um, it created a, you know some remarkable opportunities. USA Today had always had a strong U.S. presence, but we've never had foreign bureaus like the New York Times, Washington Post, LA mm -hmm. Times, and some of the others. So you know, here's here's a you know. 9-11, one of the most important stories of, you know, our age. And yeah. we had no one really in the, in the Far East. So all of a sudden, a bunch of us got tabbed on various assignments and various elements 
to do it. So I was sent to Pakistan. Um, I, um, you know, had to go and get a round of shots. Mm -hmm. Um, I had to go in with cash because I had, there was no credit cards that could be used there. So I put $3,000 and hundred dollar bills in each shoe. And I had (laughs) $4,000 tucked in my pants in a place that no one would ever want to go. So, (laughs) so I had $10,000 in cash and I, you know, was at the Islamabad Marriott and, which later got bombed. Mm-hmm. And um, within 24 hours of being in Islamabad, I was taking a handoff from another reporter who was immensely talented and had had a lot of foreign policy experience, a lot of foreign reporting experience. And we got in this car, we got in this taxi, and we drove to Peshawar, which is right on the Afghanistan border, uh, because we'd gotten a tip that CIA operatives were you know, very active out there. And we're trying to do anything about mm-hmm. what they might think, where, where bin Laden might be. You know, the best way was to try to figure out where the activity was happening, knowing that that's probably the hot zone. If we can interview people there, um, you know, that could get us to the story. So we ended up that night, I remember, at a military compound. Um, we had gone through three checkpoints where, you know, everybody in uh, Western Pakistan carries an AK-47, just like in the Westerns, everybody carries a six shooter. Mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. and really dicey. Here I am, this complete nail fight, and we're going through, you know, the back roads of Pakistan and Afghanistan. And um, it was just a remarkable experience. Um, I remember I called Patricia, we just started dating then, my wife, with a sat phone that night from the compound. Um, and um, I remember the taxi caught on fire. So I'd never been in a car that caught fire before. So <laughs> and everybody's pointing at the back of the car and we turn around and like flames are coming from the wheel well. And it, you know, it was remarkable. You think like that happens here that, well, they put us out of business for ages, but there, there's like a thousand repair shops right by the side of the road. You pull over and explain your car caught on fire. And in two hours it's fixed <laughs> and we're back on the road. <laughs> so, um, so that is a very amazing story. And I'm sure that not every story that you wrote was, was quite so life and death. There were probably a lot of yeah, also, you have, you have certain high points, you know, after yeah, that, yeah. um, I was back at the Islamabad Marriott. I had this wonderful driver, the same guy whose car caught on fire, named Pasha. And um, I would go to dinner at the UN club, and it was just so wonderful to feel like a foreign correspondent. At the time, I had this huge bug to go overseas, to work overseas. It's like one of the, you know, I'd been a Washington reporter. I'd, I'd, you know, been a police reporter. I'd covered two Nevada state legislatures. I'd done a whole bunch of different kinds of reporting but I had not mm-hmm. done a significant foreign assignment. So it was mm-hmm. those six weeks or two months was just a mm. fantastic opportunity to do that. But after that, it was, you know, writing more routine stories and being always nervous because it was only about a month after Daniel Pearl of the Wall Street Journal had been killed in Karachi. Right. Um, I had to be really careful uh, about, you know, where I went um, you know, just trying to make sure that I, knowing that I didn't know as much as a veteran foreign correspondent about staying safe, could get the story but not get killed. Or yes, absolutely. Well, let's let's just take a quick trip through the different uh, newspapers where you have been a reporter. Um, I think you got your start here in L.A. Isn't that right? I did. So I got my, I was at, I was, um, I had a really amazing time. I I was at Long Beach State. I was a journalism major. And they'd had this internship at the LA Times. It really wasn't working out. They'd had a few people that the, you know, they'd been disappointed in. I got the internship. And an editor there, a, a really grizzled, fantastic former Marine who lit his cigar every afternoon, took a shine to me. (laughs) <laughs> and I was up uh, all these fantastic assignments. Um, 
As an I, intern? Uh, as an intern. So I was writing a, it turns out that at the LA Times at the time, you had these amazing veteran reporters who all wanted to work on big project stories. No one really wanted to write daily stories or quick features. So that became sort of my forte. Um, it's, it worked out so well. I ended up being there for about two and a half years. Um, mm. After, um, uh, you know, a year uh, as an intern and a summer intern, I got the police beat on weekends. So at the same time as I had the police beat on weekends, I was also uh, a copy boy for KFWB All News Radio, News 98. And uh, <laughs> I... Uh, so I would on uh, I would see my girlfriend on Friday nights till mm -hmm. 11 p.m. I would get in my Volkswagen Beetle, drive to Hollywood, do the overnight shift at the radio station. Then I would throw a sleeping bag in the back room and get a get some shut eye. And then that that, that evening, about three o'clock, I would do a shift at the LA Times on the police beat, and then go right back to the radio station and work until Sunday morning. And then oh my goodness. Home without sleep. And so, that was, um, I did that for about a year. And it was a, it was a ball. I mean, there were so many amazing stories going on in the city at the time. The Hillside Strangler was going on and I'd be working at the overnight radio station and then they'd find another body. And it was just a remarkable thing. Uh, when you're on the police beat, um, how are you listening to scanners? How do you know what's where the crimes are? So at the time, the police beat was this thing that I thought would turn into a sitcom because it was the craziest characters I had ever seen. Uh, the police beat was three metal desks in a uh, dilapidated room at Parker Center, which was the police headquarters, the LA Times, the Herald Examiner, and uh, City News Service. Um, the police beat was young men and women who were just breaking in, or old men, not women, who were sort of in their last legs or something hadn't worked out for them or one thing or another. And so they were sort mm -hmm. of banished to the police beat out of their own main offices. So on your so, way up or on your way down? <laughs> so... Uh, you know, it was, uh, and then you would sit there and you would be calling police departments all night. Bell Gardens, Alhambra, uh, West Covina, every little single suburban police department and say, anything going on tonight? And they'd say, yeah, we had a fatal or yeah, we had a single, you know, murder. And then you would get the stories and you'd write them on copy paper in your typewriter. And then you'd share them with the other reporters in the office because it was a cooperative police beat. And, um, and that was the police beat. Um, one night we were grilling steaks in the parking lot outside and a police lieutenant <laughs> rushed in and senators are smelling the steaks through the air conditioning system and they think they're going to get steaks and there's going to be a riot. So you can't grill <laughs> steaks anymore outside the press room. <laughs> wow, that is amazing. So wait a minute, but so being on the police beat was you didn't you go to see the crimes or go to the scenes of the crimes or did you just hear about them? Not the way it worked in LA. So in LA, it was just the weekend police beat and then you would phone the office. You would phone the LA Times 2 blocks away and talk to the city room and they'd give you a rewrite reporter and you'd tell them, you'd dictate to them what had happened. Because at the time, there were no computers, there was no fax right, machines, right. none of that had right, come along right. yet. So you dictated everything. Amazing. And then my first job was at the Las mm -hmm. Vegas Sun, mm -hmm. where I was the day, I was day cop, daytime police reporter. There, every murder and every fatal accident, no fun. Not something huh. I really enjoyed doing. How long but, were you able to keep doing that? Vegas, so you really yeah. couldn't go wrong in Vegas. Um, <laughs> you know, it was, it was an amazing news town. You could drive down the strip, and every single casino you knew what kind of mob scandal had happened there. And frankly, it was the heart of that era. I mean, the movie Casino um, was about the very time in which I was in Vegas, in which Anthony Spilotro was the reigning mobster. Um, mm -hmm. 
You know, you hung out at the Stardust. You know, you knew all these characters. All these characters know you. Um, that kind of stuff. It sounds kind of swanky and glamorous. I wasn't at the time because I was making $200 a week and driving a beat up Volkswagen <laughs> and was probably the lowest of the low people on the totem pole. Okay. It was, okay. you know, in retrospect, it was an amazing training ground for a reporter. Um, when because I there was the so Times, much crime, you mean? Well, you know, when I've been at the LA Times, I was surrounded by these veteran reporters who I idolized. They were just fantastic, amazing talents. And they would say to me at dinner, go to a smaller market. Don't stay here in LA. Don't be cradle to grave for the LA Times. Go to a smaller market, learn the craft, you know, win some awards, make mistakes, and then come back. So I took that advice, and that's how I ended up in Vegas. Interesting. You know, we're getting some questions in the chat. Someone, oh, Tom Abbott wants to know, is the mob still in Vegas? Wow, what a great question. No, the answer is, well, you know, who knows? One of these days, maybe the scandal will break. But when I was there, it was still mostly the era of, you know, individually owned casinos or corporations that had, in which the mob had had a hand in creating them. There wasn't the kind mm -hmm. of shareholder scrutiny there is now. Frankly, in Vegas today, there's two major companies, MGM and I can't remember the other, that run Make most of the strip. They have almost all the strip. And they, you know, these are companies that are, uh, you know, greatly um, regulated. Um, the other was uh, the owner of the Venetian who just passed away last week. Um, you know, those two major companies own much of the strip. When I was in Vegas, um, there was, you know, skimming was the thing. At one point, at the Stardust, naturally, um, you know, they would pull money out of the count room and put it on trucks and send it to Chicago. At one point, they sent a truck with 80 tons of quarters to Chicago. So the money couldn't be taxed. It was off the books. It went right to the mob. Wow, wow, wow. So now it's really different, it sounds like, really different in Vegas. So you, you went there. Hey, by the way, what does the, the, the term cub reporter mean? I've always loved that, the sound of that. Was that who you, know, you just, were when you were an intern? Proud, just, just as I'm proud of being a newspaper man, I was proud of being a cub reporter. A cub reporter <laughs> is just a, it's just a rookie. It's like Jimmy Olsen and Superman. It's, you know, where you, where you, you know, you're, you're, you're working your heart out and you're learning the craft. You know, you have a lot of rough edges, but you found something you just think is the coolest and you're trying so hard to succeed. That's a cover reporter. When you're five years, you become a journeyman. Even if there's no union, you're just known as a journeyman. Oh, uh, oh. means you're supposed to know what you're doing. I see. So when you were in Vegas, were you still a cub? Um, not. I didn't really think of myself as such. I mean, there's no designation. You were a journey, you were a it's journey. not official. Because no, I, I know. worked no, I at know. the LA Times, I um, and had so much other experience that way. I didn't think of myself as a cub at that point. How, in retrospect, I probably was because I still had a ton of rough red. You know. I had some amazing assignments. I mean, there's also things I could have done better. What's an example of a rough edge back then? Oh, um, you know, the, the, the very things you would expect, you know, making a mistake in a story and having to run a correction, not checking your facts. Um, you know, the thing, you know, it's like reporting is like driving a car. You think you know it all and then something happens that catches you by surprise that you never thought about. You know, there's a thousand little sort of reporting tricks of the trade that you learn to try to avoid mistakes because it, accuracy and fairness count above all else. You know, example, I, you know, anytime someone, you say you're interviewing someone on the phone, and they, they say I'm 50 years old, you say, is that 1-5 or 5-0? Because the two sound so alike. There's just all little things of things that have tripped yeah. you up in the past that you try to remember not to get tripped up on again. Mm, mm. I suppose judgment too. Well, yes, judgment too. But you have editors to help you on judgment. I mean, mm. you know, you, you come up with your own story ideas, you'll run them past somebody and say, you think this will work? 
Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Mm, mm. So there's that. So so you were in, in Las Vegas, and after that, did you come to the LA Herald Examiner? No, I had an intermediate stop. I uh, oh yeah oh yeah. I went to um, I I moved to Carson City, Nevada, and was the first state bureau chief for you for the Las Vegas Sun. I covered oh. state government. I had never really fit well in Las Vegas. It wasn't my kind of town. Um, I, Northern Nevada was really wonderful. Um, the state capital was a little gem of a city. And uh, so I was up there and then I got a job offer from some ex LA Times people at the Hartford Current. I went back there, was there for three months, got fired. Didn't do anything wrong, just didn't do enough. I was really having a hard time learning how the East works. Mm -hmm. So came West, maybe you had the same experience where Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just it, East, East Coast is operate differently. And I had a hard time adjusting. I was like 25 years old. Um, but anyway, so I, I uh, that didn't work out. But uh, what was it I like to get I, what was it like to get fired? Were you upset at the time or were you philosophical about it? Furious? Devastated. I'd only been there three months. But remember, mm -hmm. this is the post Watergate era. Everybody wanted to be a reporter the competition was immense. And I'd had this really good gig going to that point. I really thought I had momentum. So to just get fired was a killer for me. Mm. Mm. But, you know, like so many things that happen like that, it ended up being a great thing for this reason. I packed up my little car, my little Toyota at this point, and came back mm -hmm. to LA. And I got the job at the Herald. And at this point, I had such a drive to succeed um, I was not going to, I was not going to fail at this point. So it was like, whatever it took, I would do, um, to succeed at that job, write as many stories as it could. I remember I had a shift that was supposed to start at like two in the afternoon and I would come in at like nine or 10 in the morning and just work <laughs> for four hours in the, in the newsroom, then start my shift because I really want to succeed. That is amazing. That's what it takes sometimes, isn't it? Just being when you're back against the wall. That's what you do. But you know, had my back not been against the wall, maybe I wouldn't have worked as hard. I don't know. Mm. What was the LA uh, Ex Herald Examiner like? I don't think that paper exists anymore, does it? It went under in '89, and there's a ton of mm -hmm. it still out around. There's you know, like a Herald Mafia around town of, mm -hmm. of former. Mm -hmm. Uh, Herald people that are so proud to work there. Next to the USA Today, the Herald Examiner was the most fun I ever had um, as a reporter. It was, you know, a old school newsroom. Imagine um, like steel desk, a whole just rows of steel desks that hadn't really mm -hmm. changed since, you know, the 50s. Mm -hmm. um, we're all working on typewriters. But at that point, computers had come in and we would all, they had like only like 10 of them. And we'd all move back to writer stories in this, you know, this one little area. And it was so much fun because you'd be sitting across, you'd be writing a story on a, on a, you know, at this point I was doing general assignment. So I'd be writing a story on whatever. And across from me would be the dance critic. And over there would be a sports writer. And there in the end would be Linda Breakstone, a political reporter, you know, chain smoking, you know, with one of those little ashtrays that's supposed to keep the smoke from going around. And you, we had these wonderful discussions. I'd end up talking to one of the food writers about, you know, what are they working on or whatever, all, as we're all writing our stories, all facing each other. It, you know, and at the time, we were so competitive with the LA Times. Us and the Daily News would do anything to kick the LA Times rear end. And um, so we knew that their weakness was local news. So we really pushed hard on local news and did some great work. Now, was it an afternoon paper? Afternoon paper, but by the time I'd gotten there, it had vastly improved. It had, it had gone, undergone a strike that lasted 10 years, and when the strike ended, they put a lot of, Hearst put a lot of money into it to try to make it sort of hip and happening and mm -hmm. very sort of central LA oriented. And um, I can't think of a good example of, of another publication like that right now, and certainly not the New York Post, but um, it, it was trying to be cool, kind of like an LA magazine that does daily news. And mm -hmm. um, 
and so it was it was you know just the, it was just the right time to be there but it was mostly a morning operation in terms of the newspaper right i see um uh Stuart Falk is in the, ta- in the chat, and he says, John McCabe was the last published of the Herald Examiner, last publisher of the Herald Examiner. I had worked with him at the New York Times. Hmm, interesting. Um, yeah, was, I, he I, was he the... I, I remember there was this wonderful guy at the end who was a publisher. You know, when you're a reporter, you generally have very little. The, the publishers generally don't come in the newsroom very much. Like at the LA mm-hmm. Times, I remember on... Uh, to really date myself, um, <laughs> election night, presidential election night, 1976, Otis Chandler walked the newsroom with his son, Norman, and greeted everybody. And that was kind of cool to see Norman, you know, see Otis Chandler, who was the, the publisher of the LA Times, one of the best known publishers in the country, sort of make the round. Amazing. Rounds. Amazing. Amazing. So, so you were you at, were at uh, the LA Herald Examiner, and after... After that, oh, wait, wait, how many years were you at the LA, LA Herald Examiner? I'll be there for about four years. But during that time, you know, we did the night, you know, I was present for the naming of the Night Stalker. Uh, you know, there's just this new Netflix series on, on the Night Stalker. It mentions the Herald Examiner and that, um, you know, uh, did some other, you know, amazing stories. Uh, the McMartin preschool case was one that I ended up mm-hmm. having a big part of. Uh, in fact, they made a TV movie out of it. My name is in the movie. I'm on a Chris. <laughs> so Wooden was the star of the TV movie. And um, a, a, in the movie, one of the characters picks up a telephone and it says, it's Chris Woodyard from the Examiner. Woo. Now, now, wait a minute. It's Chris Here's Woodyard from the Examiner. <laughs> you had arrived. Basically, that was the moment when you arrived. Yeah. So... So um, when you're writing a story, especially over a period of time about uh, a serial killer or something horrible happening to children, you know, th- stories like that, that are just, that are just um, about unspeakable tragedy, how do you cope with that? Great question. Um, I, you know, we certainly had those stories. And um, at times I had to go out to try to talk to families. I remember at one point we were doing a series about all the deaths at the time, the murder rate was going through the roof in LA. And we were doing a piece on every single murder that happened in one week in Los Angeles. And we, and I had been, I had to go out to the field and try to get headshots, head photographs of every murder victim. And the answer is you sort of develop, you know, you're, you're, you keep in mind, you, 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 I think all reporters believe in their hearts of hearts that they're doing the right thing and they're not taking advantage of people. They're putting their cards on the table. You know, in the modern age, we, you know, you are not allowed to deceive. You're not allowed to impersonate. None of that. And you, and you realize that's sort of a chance to be human with someone. That story where I had to go out and get as many pictures of, of people that have been killed that week was kind of that moment for me where I realized I can have a positive influence on these people. My own father dropped dead in 1983. And I remember at the time thinking, I would love it if someone would call and want to talk to me about my father. And um, so it was just that way. Um, I would go out and you develop a bedside manner and you back off if people are hostile or they don't want to talk to you. But I was really impressed at that time about how nice people were and how they really did want to talk about their lost loved ones. Mm-hmm. You know, they'd been mm-hmm. the, many had been the victims of crime. Some of them had been gang members. A lot of them were gang members. But they, you know, wanted these people to be memorialized. They wanted to be remembered. Um, mm-hmm. Personally, it didn't have that big an impact on me in terms of I didn't need psychological counseling after covering a lot of this grisly stuff. Um, and yes, there's gallows humor that goes with it in, in newsrooms, just like there is at police precincts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure there is. Um, but it sounds like in those human moments with the survivors of, 
of loss, um, if you're giving them a chance to bear witness to this person that they lost, you're giving them a gift, a huge gift. That's how I like to think of it. Um, you know, you, 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 you never, you know, it's like any profession. You want to, you want people to feel good about the experience. You want to, you know, you feel like you're, you're trying to do, you're trying to bring about good in the world through informing people about the news. And that was part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, early on, you were talking about how, um, the sort of core of being a reporter is the quest for truth and accuracy, truth and accuracy. Um, do you think that's still true in this era in which we're living now? I think it's more among true reporters. Than ever for this, I think it's more true than ever for this reason that, you know, in my early part of my career, you couldn't fact check. You know, the average person couldn't fact check things. You know, if you see a news story now, you can go through and almost look line by line of what else, who else has written about these things? Where did they get this fact from? Um, a lot of newspapers like the New York Times are, have been amazing, Washington Post in particular, that they'll, in the story, they'll put links to where they found documents. Uh, they'll show you the actual document. Um, mm. you, know, one could, you know, one could argue all day about whether the stories are written in a way that gives them sort of a tilt that, that Bias. might Bias. Yeah. they're not yeah. being fair. But my sense is there's such a multiplicity of voices out there, so many different news sources coming from different points of view, that in the end there's enough there to form an opinion and, and for these reporters to still be proud of their work. Betsy Anderson has a, has a follow-up. Um, she says that she, it seems that reporters seem to be writing editorials rather than giving information to their readers these days. What do you make of that? You know, I, I, you know, I, I won't argue with that. I mean, sometimes I see stories that I say, I think they're pushing this point of view too hard and it comes across more as, as an editorial than um, a straight news story. They are supposed to be labeled analysis or something of that sort to indicate that, you know, reporters are giving more their view of things. Um, you know, certainly the news business has changed. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly readers and viewers are demanding, um, you know, I mean, you know, more sizzle in these stories, which sometimes can, can come from reporters that put more of their own thoughts into them. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it is what it is. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, to this day, I'm still proud of the news business at USA Today. We were really under the gun to, you know, accuracy was so important. Um, you know, when you went through a story, I, I would put a thousand links in there just so everyone could see where I, you know, who said what, where they said it and that sort of thing. And God forbid we had a, a you know, have to do a correction, which required so, all this stuff, so. including approval, all the way from the editor in chief. It was an ugly process that you didn't want to be part of. They made it that <laughs> way on purpose so we would stay accurate. Is the is USA Today, which is which is your most recent job? You were there, I think, for twenty three years. Isn't that right? Yes. Um, um, <clears throat> is that the only national newspaper that we have? Here in the, the Wall US? Street Journal, the New York Times, uh, USA Today, and one could argue these days, Washington Post. Okay. But I mean, in their names, it sounds like they're regional a little bit more than, than, USA, than Today. USA Today. Yeah, I mean, traditionally, USA Today has been sort of the paper of Main Street. Wall Street Journal has been the newspaper of, of the financial world of Wall Street. And the New York Times was sort of the newspaper of elites and decision makers and influencers. Um, and then Washington like, Post would be politicians. Yes, you know, um, it, you know, really it was sort of, it's sort of super insidery Washington. When Bezos took over, they cut back on a lot of their other domestic bureaus just to focus intensely on covering government and, and Washington. 
Um, you know, the New York Times is a little broader than that. Um, but, you know, those are real rough. That's sort of a rough assessment of how the world used to be. These days, you know, there's so many upstart news agencies and things. It's, it's a little more complicated. Stuart Falk wants to know, what are your current major news sources in addition to the Washington Post and the New York Times? That's the way I he's the framing Wall his question. The Wall Street Journal, the New York USA Today, and the LA Times every day. The newspapers stack up in the bedroom, and my wife, Patricia, is, is sort of always on me about how much newsprint there is back there. I much prefer to read stuff in print than I do online, and the reason is because when I go online, I read sort of the, the, you know, the stories that make my, the hair on the back of my neck raise up, usually like White House doings and things like that are on the front page. But I never get back to the back, sort of the back page stories or the arts page or the book reviews or the stuff that really give me insight. Um, I find that after reading a stack of newspapers, there will be two or three or four stories that were just life changing for me that, you know, that give me a new thought, a new perspective, um, you know, that that send me off in a new direction that I probably wouldn't have found digitally or taken the time to read. Wow, I'm fascinated that you read newsprint. That's wonderful. <laughs> See, your, your fingers are always you smudgy. Follow me on this. Get a, I mean, the LA Times is an excellent newspaper. It really is. Even with all their cutbacks, I think they do a really good job. Read the LA Times for a couple of days, front to back, and tell me if I'm wrong. Um, there's some really great back page stuff in there. Um, as well as columnists and others that you might not read if you were just looking at scanny headlines online. Chris, how do you even get a paper newspaper these days? Well, I retired from USA Today a month ago, but um, I've been picking up the newspapers at the Bureau and delivering them to the office assistant who, because of COVID, isn't going in regularly. Um, so I'm basically doing them a favor. Um, mm -hmm. but they're doing me a huge favor by letting me read the newspapers that I'm then returning to them uh, because no one's going into the bureau. Once the pandemic mm -hmm. ends, I'll have to kind of take out a few subscriptions here and there. But to me, okay, it's a really okay. good use of money. I wonder, I wonder, uh, I'm just going to ask the people in the chat to, to say whether they read newsprint or or if they access their news digitally. So anybody in the chat who wants to answer that question, you're welcome to. So we've talked about um, your time in Las Vegas. We've talked about the LA Herald Examiner. We've talked about um, the Las Vegas Sun, the LA Times. We didn't talk about the Houston Chronicle. You were, you were in Washington, DC reporting for that Texas newspaper, right? So at the time, my wife, who wasn't Patricia, had gotten a job in Washington, D.C. And I was at the L.A. Times, and, I had, and things hadn't been going great for me. They'd be going okay. I was now, so I had left the L.A. Times, and after I left the Herald, I went back to the L.A. Times. Let me restate that. I was an intern at the L.A. Times, and then a few years went by, and I came back and worked at the L.A. Times. And then that's when my wife got the job and I had to leave the LA Times at, you know, just that things were going great. But I was able to get a job in the Washington Bureau of the Houston Chronicle. Mm -hmm. And I had this fantastic experience for a year or two as a Washington correspondent. So mm. um, I had, you know, I got to cover uh, the Clinton inaugural. Um, I, uh, you know, had, you know, we'd go to the Capitol Press Gallery. I had a White House hard pass. Um, a White House a hard pass. How cool is that? The, the whole thing was very heady. You know, going to yeah. the, yeah. you know, going to the White House Correspondence Dinner, you know, in a rented show. Um, <laughs> the whole the whole thing was really heady. I got to tell you a great inaugural story. Tell me, tell well, me a perfect day for a great inaugural story. Day. So I covered the Clinton inaugural. You have no idea how cold it is out there you know, by the Washington Memorial, looking up a thousand yards to the reviewing stand. But that night I had, I was sent to cover the ball. Now I was working for the Houston Chronicle, so I was sent to cover the Texas ball. Now what mm -hmm. happens is there's like 15 balls or eight balls and the, and the president and, and the first lady are supposed to stop in at everyone and give a speech. 
So they'll have the California ball, the Mid-States ball, the East Coast ball, the Texas ball. So I was at the Texas ball and wasn't thrilled with how it was going. It seemed kind of like a slow starter. So I mm-hmm. wandered across the hallway at the Washington Marriott into another room and discovered I was in the like Rocky Mountain States ball. Uh-huh. And it, was like a, it was like a high school dance. It was sort of dimly lit, a real <laughs> ceiling. And there was this band up there with a little rope around them. And then, but, and like five people hanging around the band and at the, you know, all around the edges were all the political people, all like cutting deals and trying to get jobs in the new administration. Okay. So I went up to the band and I'm standing by the velvet rope, like four feet from the band. And they start playing witchy woman. And I turned to the guy <laughs> next to me and, and, and I said, I turned to the guy next to me and go, oh, it's, that's, I know that it's song. The Eagles. It's the Eagles. And he gives me this, you know, hang dog look and says, that is the Eagles. And I look over. And it's the Eagles, and no one's paying attention <laughs> because because it's Washington. Everyone's so into their own thing that you know here's like the Eagles playing, and and like they have no audience, and it's you know they are they're you know there were no risers. They're like right there in front of you, just like you're at the high school prom. Oh, that's hilarious! That is hilarious. Well, so that's a great that's a great inauguration story. Uh, news-wise, this just in, I'm learning that Doug Jones reads the LA Time newsprint. Um, Betsy Anderson, <laughs> Betsy Anderson reads the uh, LA Times for news, local news, and watches PBS for other news. And that's that's what I do too. And then uh, Jim Buonamani loves newsprint. <laughs> And uh, and Comfort, Comfort, Comfort Ogbonamuri, um, she has the LA Times delivered to her house, but she discontinued it before the pandemic. Kevin Hill reads the LA Times online and gets newsprint on weekends. He says he much prefers newspaper, but papers stack up. I have this theory that things in life were invented out of sequence. So when you think about it, if let's say we were born into a world in which everything's digital. So all our friends mm-hmm. are reading digitally. Our parents were five years mm-hmm. old. Our parents are all reading digitally. And along 10 years later or 20 years later, someone says, I, I have this amazing invention. I will take the best of the news. I will have it professionally edited, delivered on your doorstep every day in a way that you can glance through the stories and quickly read what you want to read or not want to read without having to open and close it and all that. And that would be a newspaper. I think it was invented out of sequence. (laughs) That's funny. Tom Abbott watches BBC. Fair enough. BBC is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And Stuart Fox says, Stuart Fox says, I read my news digitally, have an RSS feed from the New York Times, email links from the Washington Post and the LA Times e-newspaper, plus Axios, Politico, et cetera. (laughs) We got some news junkies here in the the chat. Um, I liked what you said about USA Today being Main Street. Can you say a little more about the importance of a newspaper that's, that's Main Street? Well, um, the great, the th- you know, I was never that comfortable re- as a, you know, a journeyman reporter at the LA Times. It just seemed too stuffy for me, a little bit too elite. Mm. But when I got to USA Today, it felt really comfortable place to be. At the time, they were hiring, you know, myself aside, top rate journalists. I mean, really impressive credentialed people from other places. But the idea was we're going to work in a do first-rate reporting, deep reporting, but write it in a in a way that people can just grasp it easily. Um, you know, uh, shorter stories, not these like multi-page reads, mm-hmm. and um, and stories written with were just crammed with facts, uh, but written in a way that were engaging and that sort of thing. That yes, was the Main yes. Street formula, and I thought it worked really well. It and was, color and photography. photography. And color photography and a big weather page. I mean, yes. I would get on an airplane in the 90s, and you'd see like 20 copies of USA Today being read in front of you. 
you could watch people read your story. It was a heavy How experience. How fun is that? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I remember when it, I remember when the first time I looked at a USA Today and I remember thinking, man, this is readable. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, that was the formula. You know, it's, yeah. it's yeah. changed over the years. So by the time I'd left, you know, because we weren't the travel, we, there there wasn't as much emphasis on being the traveler's newspaper anymore because of the pandemic, there's no travelers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it had, mm -hmm. you know, they were doing tons of investigative stories, much, much longer stories than when I was there. Um, mm -hmm. Some really mm -hmm. great work. Interesting. Well, all right. I have so many questions. I'm almost running out of time, but so I'm going to just start shooting questions at you. A favorite story that you wrote, thinking back to your career, something that 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 you're so proud of. The quickest one that comes to mind is I'll I'll give you two. Quickest one okay. that comes okay. to mind is I did a story about a year or two ago about homeless in LA, of, of an issue that I care deeply about, as I know you do, about how the money was being spent for housing and the fact that they were building seven hundred thousand dollar condos for homeless people that meant that there would be far less money left to take care of, you know, you'd be able to help a few in a big way, but it would mean so many were uh, being left on the street. And I was really proud mm -hmm. of that story. Um, mm -hmm. I did a story um, also a year, uh, more recently over the summer about uh, how African-Americans were being discriminated against in hotels, in particular- Racial profiling. Racial profiling, but they would, you know, they would be paying guests and they would be in the lobby and they were being approached saying, uh, sir, do you belong here? Um, I read was, that I, story. That was amazing. And, and that's an example of a story that could make real change. Sure it did. Um, I'm hoping it did. You know, it's the kind of thing that, uh, you, you don't know if management, these are sporadic things in an industry where it's a franchise business. You know, Hilton doesn't own its own hotels or Marriott doesn't own its own hotel, hotels. They have franchises that operate by their own rules, but they have some influence over them. And, but it's the kind of thing that gives a brand such a bad rap. And yeah, so one yeah. hopes that change came about from that story. I love it when change comes about from my stories. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, and back to the pandemic, your final year at USA Today as bureau chief and also a uh, writer on stories about airlines and automotive and retail and so many other things, general news, um, just that, everything. <laughs> um, what was that last year like in the pandemic for you? So different. It must have been so different. And I think that's one of the things that sort of convinced me that it was time to retire. The, um, you know, this is no different than what all of us are going through. What everyone that had an office job has gone through. You know, you go from being in a, in a you know, the fun, the, part of the big fun of the newsroom, news business is being in a newsroom. They're, you know, it's filled with really interesting, outgoing, very smart, educated people that you can engage with in all kinds of ways. And, I, you know, just being in a newsroom and being their bear chief was a lot of fun. So all of a sudden you go to being in your, your own bedroom, you, you can still work the phone, you still have a computer, you can still do those things, but it's not like you're not running out on stories anymore, that sort of thing. It, so it's, it was kind of depressed. It's been kind of depressing. It was kind of depressing. Um, well, you know, I'm thinking what a contrast that is to that wonderful moment you described uh, uh, with, uh, was it at the Las Vegas Sun when you were, no, where was it, when you were with, uh, sitting in that same room with uh, arts writers and, and remember the, the ashtray that was supposed to take the smoke away? And, right. and that's exactly what I'm talking about. You know, at USA that, Today that, in the bureau here in Los Angeles, you know, we had these marvelous entertainment writers. I could, you know, we, I, you know, the, the film writer would come in and we'd talk movies for 15 minutes or, you know, someone just read an interesting book, you know, and these are professionals who are paid to know things that far go far beyond average conversation. You know, you can yeah. get celebrity gossip. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. all those things. 
And also the excitement of like when I was at the Herald and, you know, it's a quiet morning and they say they've, they've, you know, the Night Stalker just got arrested in East L.A. How fast can you get out there? And mm -hmm. a bunch of us go out there and we track down the route that the Night Stalker took before he got arrested. The Night Stalker being the mass murderer who's the subject of that Netflix series that just came out a week ago. Mm -hmm. So um, one thing that, that, that's, that's really, I mean, maybe this is obvious, but what I'm sensing from you so much is that you are insatiably curious. I guess, um, you know, that's, that's one of the things that makes a great reporter is curiosity, wondering why things work the way they do and wondering if maybe they don't work as well as they should. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. um, you know, you're paid to ask questions and be curious. Um, you know, so yes, that's one of the most important traits of being a reporter is being curious. And so, so I get it that, that, that during the pandemic year, the sort of, um, the energy and the alchemy of a, of a newsroom was lost for you. And it's so, so you made the decision to retire, but you're obviously not retiring your, your, your passion for stories. So what do you think is going to happen next? Should we take a poll in the chat to see what people think you should do next? We need a poll for this. I'm not sure what the next <laughs> act is. I, um, I'm sort of waiting to get my inoculations. It's only yes, been two yes. months now. I, um, you know, have talked to uh, Father John about the food, you know, maybe volunteering for the food, food programs at mm -hmm. uh, St. James. I um, am, would really like to do some sort of public service um, something along those lines, maybe. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I might get another journalism job, but um, I don't really need to at this point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's hard. It's a hard transition being going into retirement from, I think, for many people. Some, it's mm -hmm. just great. They have, the, you know, all these things they love to do. They have a hobby they've always wanted to pursue. Um, they always wanted to load up an RV and drive around the country. Um, I feel kind of driven toward public service or dr driven toward trying to do more good in the world because I felt like I was doing that in my journalism career. The problem with journalism is you get to be a, on the sidelines of things. You don't get to be on the playing field. You're, you know, you're on the sideline. You get a front row seat. You get to go amazing places and do amazing experiences, but you're not the person that you know, is directly doing things in many cases. So maybe there's an opportunity for that for me. Yeah, I think so. You know what I, what, what immediately comes to my mind is, um, you know, that story that you wrote about, about homelessness and how the housing options were not, were not practical for reaching the most people. And there's a lot of talk right now about, you know, pallet houses and all sorts of innovative, uh, small, small, tiny homes and all sorts of ideas like that. I really think that, that there need to be more people pushing those options. We just need more housing. I think that it's those kinds of innovations that can make a big difference. The LA Times just had that story about how LA County's tiny homes, villages of tiny homes, were costing like 120 grand each by that time they what? put in what? plumbing and the whole thing, whereas Riverside County was doing it for about 12,000 each. So the same problems persist. You know, you think you come up with a low cost solution to the problem, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, you know, it depends on how it's done. It, it may or may not be low cost. Um, yeah, that's right, and that's where the reporter's eye for um for detail matters you know jim guanamani says i love how much passion you have for your work chris any advice for young career seekers i'm sorry he wants to know do you have any advice for young career seekers um in journalism my advice is um uh, just start writing these days you know because of the web and because there's so many small news operations 
you can, you know, you can start writing directly, but if you're serious about it, if your goal is to get to a major news organization, you know, take the traditional route, go to a really small news operation online or traditional and, um, you know, get on the police beat, you know, become a food writer, get to a place where you can get a mentor and get professional editing and learn the craft if you don't already have a journalism degree. Great. And Betsy Anderson is saying, um, Chris, please help St. James be ever more vigilant in its ministries to those outside its doors. <laughs> and Stuart, let's see, Stuart Fox says, um, interesting things too being done with homeless and mental health. Um, that's true. Um, I was fascinated tonight to learn how many people read print still. I'm feeling... I'm feeling like I need to go back to, to reading newsprint. <laughs> so it works for you. I just know that, as I mentioned, after I get done reading a bunch of newspapers, I feel like, yeah. oh, I understand the world now. I really get it. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. And think of all the ways that you've been helping us understand the world through these through this amazing career of yours. I love it. I love I it. You're a newspaper man. You. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I think we share curiosity. That's for sure. Because I, I just love hearing people's stories. It's my favorite. It's my favorite thing. As do I. Um, yeah. Yeah. And you know, uh, it, it's just a fantastic thing. You know, most people don't realize how interesting they actually are. Um, and I know. once you I engage know. them, you're amazed what you find. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> um, well, I can't thank you enough. I really can't. It's been wonderful to have you with us tonight. We're so proud at St. James that you're a part of the community and you spend a lot of your time at St. James uh, reaching out to other people and learning about them and helping them connect to the community. And I know you'll keep doing that. It's amazing. And I've learned so much tonight. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for the great questions and for those that also offer questions. Yes, we've yes, all loved we've being all with loved you being tonight. You're the, You're the best. Thank you. Thank you, Chris Woodyard. And good night, everyone. Stay safe and we'll see you soon next week.